thank you very much for having me here, and uh, thank you for that very kind introduction. I, I spent yesterday afternoon at the building of the Schwarzman Scholars at Tsinghua, um, and it didn't occur to me to point out to Mr. Schwarzman, had he been there, that he had written a book which hadn't been nominated for the F.T. McKinsey Prize, so um, I appreciate you, you saying that, that's very kind of you. Um, so I wanted to, to spend a little bit of time today, I, we've agreed that I'll, I'll speak for about 30 or 40 minutes, um, to talk about perceptions of BRI from outside of China, uh, in part because for China's signature foreign policy initiative, it seems to be an area where the perceptions of BRI in the West and in other countries, particularly India, differ very substantially from perceptions of BRI within China. And so somehow uh, it can be helpful, I think, to play back the way that the changes in, uh, in BRI are being perceived internationally and, and what the discussion is about BRI's future in the aftermath of the second BRI forum earlier this year. But just to give you a little bit of background on, on Andy was very kind um, in his introduction. I am a recovering journalist, so um, one of my students from the Lee Kuan Yew School is kind enough, former students, is kind enough to come along today. Um, and so I was with the Financial Times and other uh, Western media institutions for the best part of 10 years. I'm now at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy in Singapore, and for the purposes of this talk, we have a small center which is uh, very similar to CCG, um, called the Center on Asia and Globalization. Um, and that center looks at regional geopolitics, geoeconomics, the trade war, notions of regional and, and world order, um, in an attempt to provide other academics, but also political decision makers with analysis about the changing state of globalization in Asia. And as Andy said, um, I most immediately prior to this spent five years living in India. This was the book that I published last year. It doesn't really have very much to do with what I'm going to talk about here, um, but this does. This is a little bit more relevant. Um, so I, I began to get interested in BRI, in a sense, even before BRI was born. Um, so this is a picture of me in Hambantota in Sri Lanka, the, the now infamous port project uh, com built by China and instigated by Mahinda Rajapaksa, the, the then president uh, of Sri Lanka. And I used to cover Sri Lanka for the Financial Times. This was in the period after the end of the Sri Lankan Civil War, uh, in which China and what China was doing in Sri Lanka was really the thing that most interested my editors in London. It was the, the way that you could get people interested in what Sri Lanka was doing was to, to talk about China and Chinese investments. And so this port, I have to say when I first went to visit it, this was the first trip I took there, I was rather disappointed by what I found. Um, and I suspect that for all of the, the, the news coverage about this port, you also might be uh, disappointed by what you find there, because in the coverage of Hambantota, it has become this totem of what is what's called debt trap diplomacy, and you would get the impression that this was a gigantic facility of the sort that you'd find in Shanghai or Singapore. Um, and this is basically, that's what there is to see in the port. There's not really very much there. Um, there there's one small container terminal. There were various cars parked there that were shipped in uh, and parked there before being driven around to another container facility. Very small, seemingly very significant. But it took on outsized diplomatic importance as an example of uh, particularly Western fears of what may happen with some of the more strategic Chinese infrastructure projects. And so from this beginning, both as a journalist and then latterly as a researcher in our think tank in, in Singapore, I followed um, BRI both at the, the top level but also tried to learn more about BRI projects most recently in Southeast Asia, in Malaysia, Thailand, Myanmar, which I will talk about a little bit uh, in this presentation, to try and get a sense of how we should understand China's ambitions 
for BRI, and, and in a sense, which of the competing and contrasting explanations for that is more persuasive. Um, so I want to talk really about three things today. So I want to talk about what happened at the BRI forum earlier this year and place that in a wider geopolitical um, component or discussion, in particular looking at some of the criticisms that were made outside of China on BRI and, and how um, President Xi responded to those at the forum and, and what we now see to be happening. I want them to talk a little bit about the challenge of delivering that vision, the, the, in a sense the adaptations to the BRI model that we are expecting, and then I want to conclude by saying a few things about BRI's place in a changing regional order in Asia, um, and to answer my, my question, which is can the world ever come really to love China's mega projects given all of the controversy um, that they cause? So the, the, the big picture context for this, I think, should be, should be clear enough, um, which is that the relationship between the US and China is changing very quickly, and that this is putting a lot of strain on the existing regional order that we have all become familiar with. Um, I don't think any of you need this repeated to you, but the US has been top dog in the region for quite a long time. Um, China is now challenging this along with other middle powers and so a lot of the, the architecture that has supported Asia's economic rise and um, its long-lasting military peace uh, has been coming under pressure and, and, and a large portion um, of the, the tension that is associated with, with this has come not from the Asian side but from the American side so on the right hand side there you can see one of the, the sort of fullest explanations of America's approach to this part of the world. Mike Pence has made two speeches, two quite hawkish speeches over the last year or two, one at the Hudson Institute in which he came pretty close to declaring a, a new Cold War style conflict between um, the US uh, and China. And so even while you have a, a changing balance within the region, you have U.S. policy, which is also becoming much more bilateral, much more focused on America's core economic interests, um, and to some degree less willing to intervene in regional conflicts like the one that's currently going on between Japan and Korea, and less willing to provide public goods um, in the way, security in particular, in the way that it has been in the past. And so that sort of sets up the context into which BRI um, emerges. The graph in the middle here shows which countries are America, or which, which countries have uh, their most important economic ties with either China or the US. And so you can see how dominant China's economy has become uh, in this part of the world. Um, and so although one of BRI's stated objectives is to create new economic connections within within Asia, linking China both to its periphery and then more broadly across Eurasia and to other parts of the world, in a sense, much of that job uh, has already been done. Uh, China is already the dominant economic actor for almost all, or the dominant trading partner for, for almost all countries um, in Asia, replacing the US. Uh, and that, again, provides some of the, the backdrop to what's going on in, with BRI. And that's particularly true um, in Southeast Asia, uh, where, I, where I happen to live. And, and so this changing balance is forcing a lot of countries in the region, but I think particularly so in Southeast Asia, to weigh up their relationships with the, the two great powers um, and to try and work out that the mantra in, in Southeast Asia is always, don't make us choose between, between Singapore, between China and America. We don't want to choose, we want to have good relations with both. Um, but in a sense, everybody is having to weigh up what their existing relationships are and how they stand between China uh, and the US. And so BRI also um, forms part of that uh, decision making, how you, how you weigh up that one way um, or the other. And I think it's reasonable to, to think that China's ambition um, in Asia um, 
in the medium term is to become the co-equal, if not the, the dominant player in, in this region. I don't think that should be terribly controversial to anyone to, to think that. The question is, how and under what circumstances does that occur? I think the, the median opinion, if you were to talk to people in Southeast Asia, is that this is probably uh, an inevitable transition, but on, on, on how it happens and on what time scale is, is less clear. Um, and so what you get out of this, uh, again, this is all just for easy backstory, which I think you're all familiar with, it's a new period of strategic competition. Um, during the year before the financial crisis, um, in the United States and in Europe, people used to talk about the relationship between uh, the Western powers and China as one that balanced cooperation and competition, competition in some areas, cooperation in others. The areas in which cooperation is now the, the, the sort of dominant mode, particularly in the U.S., have declined quite substantially. And so in formal U.S. documents, you will see the description of the relationship between the U.S. and China as one of strategic competition or great power rivalry. Europe still tries to hang on to this notion that there are some areas of competition and some of cooperation, partly because Europe cares more about things like climate change or the Iran deal. Um, nonetheless, again, I think it's fair to say a new era of strategic competition is upon us. Um, on the right-hand side, that graph is the Lowy Institute's Asia Power Index, which gives a rough reckoning of the resources, both hard military resources and other assets like soft power and diplomatic connections that the various powers around Asia have with the US and China very close to one another. I think China at some point reasonably soon likely to pull ahead to become the preeminent power in the region. So that sort of throat clearing to bring us on to um, some basic thoughts about BRI and what happened um, at the Belt and Road Forum this year. So I don't want to I'm trying not to paint myself into the corner of being a typical negative Westerner. Um, uh, and, and my purpose here is not to, to criticize the BRI, it's to try and understand it. But I think to sort of set the, the scene for what happened um, at the forum in April, it's useful just to reflect upon what had happened in 2018 and 2017, which is, regardless of how you view this, that there had been, at least in Western media, and amongst Western analysts, uh, a stream of increasingly negative stories about different parts of the, the grand BRI project that was launched in 2013. Those complaints, I suspect, are reasonably familiar to all of you. The one that became most prominent was the phrase debt trap diplomacy, uh, which came out of a report by the Center on Global Development we can talk a little bit more about that if you want. It was meant in a particular way uh, to do with uh, to fo focusing on the overall indebtedness of economies, particularly very poor economies with fragile fiscal situations. But it came to be seen as a sort of catch-all for any project um, that came with a substantial amount of debt. So, for instance. Uh, and if I can, by, by sort of, that's not going to work. Anyway, if you look at Sri Lanka, right in the middle there, Sri Lanka did not qualify as a debt trap um, country under the original report. Sri Lanka doesn't have a very fragile fiscal position, and that one port project wasn't going to sort of um, uh, change that very much. Nonetheless, because of what happened in Hambantota port, uh, and a few other projects which where um, control of the port was handed back to the Chinese because the Sri Lankans couldn't repay their debts. This became seen as a sort of icon and, and some of the more suspicious people in the West thought that this was verging on the deliberate. That wasn't a view that I ever held, um, but, but there was a sense that, that that's the game that China was playing. Um, but even beyond that, there were a stream of other sort of problematic reports uh, you had a number of uh, elections, most notably in Malaysia, but also in Pakistan, where criticism of the management of Chinese infrastructure played a component uh, in the result of those elections. You had some cancelled projects. You had complaints about uh, the lack of transparency, not enough, not enough 
of the size of projects going to local workers or local businesses. Um, you had allegations of corruption, again, most substantially in Malaysia. And so this, in the run-in to uh, the forum earlier this year, meant that, in a sense, there was a perception that, that, that President Xi needed to say something to the, the critics of the, the project. Um, and I think, in, to that extent, the forum was very successful. Uh, there were even some critics, I think about a scholar like uh, Pei Min Shin uh, at Claremont University, who had suggested that such were the problems with the BRI that gradually the Chinese leadership might decide to, to downplay it and it would become less significant, you'd hear less about the brand. I, I think the forum put any such suggestions to rest given the size and scale of the gathering. Um, it had more leaders than the first one. It had some fairly eye-popping numbers. But most importantly, there was a real sense that the, the Chinese leadership had been had listened to and heard some of the problems that had occurred in partner nations. Uh, problems of transparency and accountability, corruption, environmental, su environmental sustainability, debt sustainability, and also the problem of that all of the deals were bilateral and that there wasn't enough of a multilateral component. And so in each of these areas, there was an attempt to, in a sense, change the model. And that, I think, is where we've now got to. So that in the aftermath of the forum, commitments were made to take elements of BRI in a new direction. And now the question is, to what extent uh, are, these complaint, are these new proposals going to mean meaningful changes to the way in which BRI operates, um, and if so, then will you be able to see the benefits of, the, of infrastructure investment of this kind uh, without the, the problems that have come along with it? Um, even so, let me just sort of say one more thing about perceptions of, um, of BRI, if my clicker will move on. Um, I still think it's fair to say that you still in the West get that there's a both within the academic community and within um, out there in the in the press and in the analyst community there's still five or six years on there's still a healthy debate about how should we best conceptualize what BRI actually is um, and this is not a minor debate, it, it really does split people right down the middle. And so on, on one hand, on my one hand, you have some thinkers, um, I think about somebody like Bruno Messias, um, who's a European, former Portuguese minister, wrote a book about Belt and Road, um, spoke at a forum that we organized in Singapore alongside uh, Henry Wang here from CCG, and his view is that in a sense, BRI is an incredibly ambitious plan to introduce the architecture of a new Chinese-led economic world order. That as America has dominated the last 30 years of globalization and has created global value chains which span from the US to Asia and back again, that we should really properly see BRI as an attempt to recreate something similar for China. And so that in addition to building infrastructure, the real aim of all of this is to diversify the Chinese economy through its partner nations. So as China moves up the value chain, um, you will see, for instance, lower value-added industries like steel making or basic manufacturing being moved off to BRI partner countries and China will become the kind of center of a new economic universe and so on this account, BRI is deeply strategic, well-planned, with a long-term vision, which is sort of fundamentally global and economic at its heart. You also have a different security-focused variant of that, uh, which you, amongst the more hawkish Westerners who see BRI as a, at a kind of thin end of a, of a security wedge, in which particularly the port, but also some of the transportation projects in a sense have a dual, eventual dual use purpose. Um, and so while initially they are focused on economics, 
in time, uh, you will find that, that they have other functions, potentially security and military related. Now, that's one interpretation. And the other, which you find amongst a lot of academics and commentators, is completely different, which is a very bottom-up description of how BRI has come to be and how it operates um, as a loose organizing principle uh, which helps a distributed group of state banks and local governments and their partners in different countries uh, and other actors try and coordinate in a very iterative and experimental way. And so the explanation for some of the problems that have occurred or are perceived to have occurred in BRI on this account comes from that sort of decentralized, almost uncontrolled uh, iterative process in which there have been some experiments and some models which haven't worked very well, but the system will then learn from those mistakes um, as it is doing at the moment. And those are very different accounts of what the Belt and Road Initiative is. And I think it's worth sort of pausing on the fact that still there's a lot of debate about this outside of China um, about the best way to understand exactly what is happening here. Let me, let me try and make this a little bit more concrete. I thought it would be, so let me, let me talk about the, the, the challenge of then delivering some of these changes. Um, I'm now going backwards. Um, at one level, in a sense I think you should, nobody should be too surprised by what has happened over the last five years. The scale and ambition of the project that President Xi has undertaken um, is, off, is at such a level that it would have been extremely surprising if it could have been managed without ruffling a few feathers. Um, and so looking back, I think you can argue that, that given the amount of money at stake and the number of relationships that are being forged, particularly in areas where China historically hasn't had um, a large number of partnerships, it shouldn't be terribly surprising that there have been a few growing pains um, as the, the project uh, has developed. Um, even so, you know, you do see some consistent complaints from China's partner nations, and I thought it would be quite useful to focus on one where I happen to have been recently, which I thought was a sort of interesting example of where um, BRI sits at the moment, um, which is Myanmar. So I don't know if we have any Myanmar experts in the room. Um, on the right here, you, you have some of the various Chinese projects in Myanmar, of which there are many. There is an operating oil and gas pipeline, which goes from the Bay of Bengal up towards Kunming. There are uh, various power and dam projects. There is a project to build a railway line from uh, Kunming in a, in a Y shape down towards um, the Burmese capital Yangon and also to the port on the blue dot on the left hand side, which is pronounced Chao Pu. Um, and so unlike some of, by value, the largest BRI corridor is the partnership with Pakistan, CPEC. Um, but CPEC has always seemed to me to be a slightly curious project because the, although most of the money that has been put into CPEC goes into power, the idea that China is going to have a plausible high-value trade route going over the Himalayas into Pakistan seems rather far-fetched. Whereas the economic argument for linking southwestern landlocked southwestern China with the Bay of Bengal through Myanmar seems to be me to be fairly inarguable. Um, if you could, less so for passenger rail, but if you could create a good, good fast freight line um, which went from Kunming to the Burmese border and then down to the sea and down to Yangon, and this I think has a good chance of being uh, economically uh, rewarding. Equally, there's clearly a strategic rationale. So Chinese strategic planners have long wanted, to put it very crudely, the idea of a Chinese California access to a Western Ocean. Um, and, and so 
some sense in which there could be better connectivity through Myanmar as a partner nation would be of great value economically and potentially also politically. So I spent uh, a little bit of time in Myanmar a few months ago trying to learn about this, and I thought it provided a, a rather interesting reflection on where BRI stood in one of its more important partner nations. Um, so for a start, the narrative of debt was quite resonant. Um, this wasn't just an example of, uh, of Sri Lanka. The port has become, in recent months, another example of the problem of excessive indebtedness. So when this, this port here, Chiao Pu, was started, it had a budget of somewhere between eight and ten billion dollars. Um, that has now been revised downwards to something in the region of one billion dollars. Um, and it was all that was done with advice from the Americans and the British and maybe the Australians who helped the Burmese government try and renegotiate what appeared to be an uh, excessively over-designed port project. Um, and so that is something that the Burmese government were quite happy about, that in a sense they had announced this project and, and the way that I was told it hadn't really understood how large it was going to be or what the financial commitment involved. Um, and then were quite pleased to be able to take it down to something more manageable uh, and to do so in a way that you know not everybody seemed reasonably happy with. It didn't seem to create too much bad blood on either side that this very, very large port had been turned, at least in its first stage, into a slightly smaller one. Myanmar's relationship with China is a problematic one for reasons of history. Um, it's hard to get good public opinion evidence of this, but certainly when you talk to people informally, there's some suspicion of China's motives in Myanmar just because China is so huge and Myanmar perceives itself to be small and without very much leverage in the relationship. Nonetheless, recently, because of the difficulties that Myanmar has had uh, with the Rohingya population and in Rakhine State in the west of the country and how that has damaged its relationship with the western countries and others in the Muslim world, in, in some ways its relationship with China has got stronger uh, because Myanmar doesn't have very many other friends at the moment. And so um, at the BRI summit, um, by all accounts, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi uh, and the Chinese leadership had some fairly constructive meetings. Um, and certainly the, the scale of China's activity in Myanmar seems to be growing. So the notion that somehow these BRI projects are slowing down doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, they're now working on this railway line, which again has a budget in the region of eight to ten billion dollars. The Chinese bit of it has started the Burmese bit of it is going to take rather longer, but they've begun to start scoping out um, uh, the initial plans. Um, but the way in which the projects that were chosen from for the, the China-Myanmar Economic Corridor, CMEC, bore many of the hallmarks that, that were sort of emblematic of the complaints that were made about BRI in preceding years. The, the, when I was in Yangon, lots of projects seemed to have emerged from a, a bilateral process of negotiation. It wasn't particularly clear where many of them had come from. The details about who was going to be involved in them was a little bit unclear. Some of them were very large, the building of a new city um, south of Yangon and another one uh, in Mandalay. Some of them were, were, were quite small. There was continual confusion about one project in particular, which is the giant Mitsion Dam, uh, which has been a long-standing Burmese-Chinese project, which was mothballed um, in 2011. But there's a sense that China is still keen on building that. And so out of this, I got an impression that Myanmar was quite a good case study, both for the, the scale and ambition uh, of BRI, but also the the kind of problematic way that the scale of some, the scale and pace of some of these infrastructure projects and the way in which they were developed caused problems not just for uh, Myanmar but also for, for China and for perceptions of China, which I suspect you know, the, the Chinese government didn't intend for any of this to happen and wasn't acting in, in any form of bad faith, but simply the way in which the, 
negotiations happened seem to fit the pattern of, in a sense, BRI 1.0 that some of the remarks that President Xi made at the BRI summit were meant to address. How are we doing on time, Andy? Uh, let's see, in about 10 more minutes. Okay, very good. So let me... Uh... In addition to that, so as a sort of case study, there's a growing evidence base as to the, the benefits that BRI can bring. I point this is a very interesting research report which came out from the World Bank earlier this year. The World Bank, um, led by their former director in China, set up a huge uh, uh, slew of publications to try and, in a largely fact-free area. So, to be fair, China is not particularly good at producing uh, international evidence of the costs and benefits of BRI. But then the international community hasn't really been either. And so the World Bank has done quite a lot of good work in trying to figure out what might happen if all of the promises that have been made under BRI actually came to pass. And the results are quite substantial. So you know, talking about an increase in trade uh, of between 3 and 10% within the BRI corridors, the six main uh, overland corridors. Um, so long as, and there's a big but at the end of this, that the actual infrastructure comes along with complementary policy reforms, which are not a million miles away again from the kind of things that were, were promised at the BRI forum. So not just building uh, infrastructure, this research is looking in particular at the transport um, links, uh, so the port and rail and road projects, and I guess bridges and a few other things. Um, but that in addition to that, if you want to increase trade between or within countries, you need other complementary reforms, so uh, changes in the way the borders operate, more policy transparency, improvement in institutional management, that sort of thing. There are other examples um, to counteract the, the, the rather negative view that has sat over um, some BRI projects. For instance, the Greek port of Piraeus has become a good example on the other side which China took over three or four years ago and has since turned around and become much more efficient and much more profitable under Chinese management. And so I think maybe the, the, what had become a, an unbalanced assessment of some of the problems associated with BRI may gradually over time becoming slightly less unbalanced um, as well, which I think is a good thing. That said, and this gets on to the nub of it, I, mean, I think trying to play back perceptions from outside, there remain some doubts in my mind, and I think in the doubts of other um, analysts, as to the extent to which it's going to be easy for China to deliver substantial changes to the model under which BRI has been developed. Now that's partly a geopolitical analysis. In a sense, if you sign up to make BRI more international, more multilateral, with higher standards of governance, with a kind of transparency which makes it much harder to skim money off the top, uh, which has been a problem for some of the, the projects, then you, you know, you're, you're tying your hands in other ways. And so there's a geopolitical trade-off. It limits your ability to use infrastructure in a way that China has wanted to use it, which is to build bilateral relations with partner nations in Asia and around the world. And so in a sense, although the direction that uh, infrastructure analysts have been pushing BRI comes with benefits, it comes with <coughs> geopolitical costs as well. It makes it less easy to use um, infrastructure and other forms of investment um, to make friends and influence people uh, in a way that is quite helpful if you're a rising power trying to cement your position within your region and use, use the assets um, at your disposal. There are plenty of ways that BRI could be reformed. Um, it's a, as I have said, on one account, it's a strangely decentralized, loosely organized way of, of conducting a project on this scale. Perfectly plausible to have some kind of secretariat, uh, a more formal structure, an international structure in which partner nations send delegations, or right the way up to something that is much more like a traditional 
international financial institution like the AIIB, where you have a very formal government structure. And in a sense, because BRI as a, as a brand and a series of relationships is so far away from that, there are myriad different ways in which you could begin to set up new institutional frameworks that would give BRI some element of internationalization, multilateralization, transparency, but they're not very easy to do. So to take the most concrete example, the understanding is that, um, so you could, for instance, use BRI as a platform for third parties to negotiate and fund infrastructure. So let's say you are Pakistan and Kazakhstan and you want to fund some, or Pakistan and Tajikistan, and, and a neighboring country, and you want to fund some piece of infrastructure, you could use BRI as a platform to do that in some way. So China could set up a platform that would allow others to come in and use not just BRI funding, but other multilateral sources. But this is very difficult to set up, and, and the understanding is that China is attempting to set up some kind of multilateral system housed at the AIIB, but so far there's been very little uh, information about that, and the sense is that, and this would also involve the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank and other international bodies, but so far at least, um, this hasn't seen the light of day, presumably because it's quite complicated to do that within the the confines of the way that China has run um, its projects. And so I think there's some, you know, there's a sort of wait and see. Let's